Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. We're so glad to see so many people in the room, and also we have a bunch of people on WebEx today. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, for those of you who are not in the room, I'll just tell you that we now have snacks for Grand Rounds, so we're hoping to boost in-person attendance for, for those who um, it works for. And for those of you online, I'll just remind you to please stay muted as usual. And um, if you have questions or comments for our speaker at any time, you can put them into the chat box. I'll be monitoring the Grand Rounds, and I'll be able to ask your question at the end of the presentation. And I'll turn things over now to Dr. Lowe to introduce our fabulous speaker for today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, we are welcoming today uh, Dr. Carlos Rodriguez Galindo uh, from St. Jude to deliver our annual Ronald Chard lecture. And just to remind those of you who did not know Dr. Chard, he was the director of our program from 1969 to 1992. He was known uh, for his compassionate bedside manner. He was also a premier academician and contributed to leukemia trials very early in the days when our cure rates were not nearly as high as they are now. And he modeled outstanding professionalism for generations of hematologists and oncologists. So um, Dr. Rodriguez Galindo serves as the director of St. Jude Global and chair of the Department of Global Medi Pediatric Medicine. He's also um, an executive vice president and holds the Four Stars of Chicago Endowed Chair in International Pediatric Research. That's very fancy. Um, he's <laughs> leading an effort by St. Jude to ensure childhood cancer patients have access to quality care no matter where they live. Um, he grew up in Barcelona. Uh, and he earned his medical degree from the Autonomous University of Barcelona, as opposed to a non-autonomous university. Anyway, he first came to St. Jude in 1994 as a postdoctoral fellow and then went on to serve as a clinical researcher and faculty member for more than a decade. Um, he then accepted a position in Boston at Boston Children's Hospital and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where he was director of the Pediatric Solid Tumor Program, medical director of the Clinical and Translational Investigations Program, and director of the Global Health Initiative in Pediatric Cancer and Blood Disorders. He um, also was promoted to professor of pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. He's published actually on a number of areas in childhood cancer. I was looking up his um, CV and reading all of his publications. He's focused on rare tumors, um, including retinoblastoma and adrenocortical cancer, but was also involved in numerous projects involving Ewing sarcoma, germ cell tumors, and longer Hunt cell histiocytosis. So he's truly a renaissance um, pediatric oncologist. He led the rare tumors committee within the children's oncology group for six years. In 2015, he returned to Memphis to lead the new Department of Global Pediatric Medicine at St. Jude and a new initiative, St. Jude Global. At that time, St. Jude had 24 partner sites in 17 countries that addressed 2.4% of global childhood cancer burden. And under his leadership, the program wants to expand St. Jude's reach to 30% in the next decade and to develop intervention models to ensure access to quality care for all children with cancer in the world. So not an, uh, an ambitious uh, aspiration. At present, the St. Jude Global Alliance actually includes more than 200 institutions in 68 countries. Additionally, he led an institutional effort to become the first um, World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Childhood Cancer. And as part of this partnership, WHO and St. Jude are collaborating with other organizations on this global initiative in childhood cancer. So today we welcome our esteemed speaker and an old friend. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, um, Mignon, and thank you so much, Lisa, as well, for your kind invitation to come here to Seattle and share some of the things that we do. I see lots of, you know, friends in the audience, some former fellows from St. Jude and colleagues that I have had over the years in my career as a pediatric oncologist. That brings a lot of joy to me, just to think that we're a family, that wherever we go, we find someone that has worked with us hand in hand in what we do. So let me start with that disclosure. I have no conflicts of interest, no disclosures to make. I don't see Alison Winaku here, but I just want to also remind you that in addition to pediatric oncology, I'm the poster child for not wearing a mask during the COVID times, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> That's a picture was taken of me when I was in Boston, and I guess that it was used recently to remind everyone that you need to wear a mask. <laughs> So, so, okay, let's get back to the topic. Um, so every year about 400,000 children develop cancer. So every day, you know, more than 1,000 children develop cancer in Egypt or in Guatemala or in Myanmar. Actually, during the hour that we are going to be discussing childhood cancer, 
more than 40 children will develop cancer and more than 30 of them will die of cancer during this hour. So that's, I, I, I am thinking about you know, how to address childhood cancer globally. I realize that there is one truth that we all need to accept, that if we want to cure childhood cancer and we're making progress in curing childhood cancer, we need to cure the children that have cancer. And you would think that this is the same concept, and it's not. And that is basically why we all have to think about how we can move the advances that we make in the US through our research, translational research, clinical research, and health systems strengthening to the world. But I think we are in a very good point right now, because if you think about where we were and where we are over the the last 20 years, I think we have reached a very sweet spot where childhood cancer can be prioritized. Let me start by the beginning of this century when the United Nations set the Millennium Development Goals. And one of those, if you are familiar with them, was to reduce the under five mortality rates by two thirds by 2015. So we are past that time, but we made a lot of progress. So the mortality rate for children under five were cut by more than half since 1990. And this is a major progress, but that also leads to this epidemiological transi uh, transition that you see on the right. So on the right, you see the poorest countries in the world in the left, so Western Africa, the richest on the right, that is US and Europe, North America and Europe. And, uh, and then on blue, you see the reported incidence of childhood cancer. Lisa could speak for hours about this, but the point is that the report the incidence of childhood cancer is about half in countries with limited resources than what it is here. In red, you see the uh, under five mortality rates. They are very high in Africa, very low in, uh, in North America. And think about this virtual, this magic point when the two lines cross. As countries move from left to right, the uh, under five mortality rates drop, meaning the competing risks of death uh, disappear, if you wish. And, childhood cancer becomes a problem. That's how the incidence of childhood cancer increases. And when you see in green is a polynomial figure, which is the childhood cancer related deaths. So the kids that die of cancer, it's low in Africa again, because kids die of other things. They die of pneumonia, they die of TB, they die of uh, malnutrition. They are low in North America because we do a very good job at taking care of those children. The problem is, as countries move from left to right, as childhood cancer becomes a problem, countries usually are unprepared to address that burden. That's why we see that childhood cancer-related deaths increases in the middle portion. So we need to help countries' programs move fast across that, that continuum. And so I will show here something that uh, Lisa is very familiar with, which is uh, a work that we did a few years ago as part of the Lancet Oncology Commission, trying to understand what is this burden of childhood cancer. So in the left, to the left, you see the reality. The reality is what I said, that 400,000 children develop cancer every year, but only 200 plus are actually diagnosed of cancer. So 200,000 children die without even being diagnosed. What you, he what you see on the right is the cost of inaction. If we don't do anything, if we just leave things as they are, these two lines will continue to split. So between 2020 and 2050, there will be 14 million cases of children developing cancer, but six million of them, six million of them will die completely undiagnosed. And this is not about diagnosing or not, this is also about cure rates. And so, this is the map of childhood cancer survivor, and that is a color coded, but the summary is that less than 30% of children with cancer survive. And so those of you, pediatric oncologists, that have read about childhood cancer and how all progress that we have made over the last, say, four or five decades, that's basically how we were in the US, say, in the 1960s or 70s, and then we started our journey towards curing childhood cancer. So 60 years later, we are where we were. So basically at the global scale, we are not curing more than 30% of children with cancer. So how can we, pediatric oncologists, pediatricians, try to help prioritize childhood cancer? So healthcare priorities in low and middle income countries 
uh, follow, I would say, this kind of inverted triangle or pyramid. So communicable diseases are always take priority because they can be prevented. This is a cost-effective intervention, vaccination and prophylaxis, sanitation, clean water. Then, you know, non-communicable diseases become the next priority, but that's the adult NCDs, that it's cardiovascular disorders, diabetes, obesity, etc., and cancer, then it's part of that. But pediatric cancer is then at the very bottom of that. In general, governments don't think about childhood cancer as a healthcare a priority or a healthcare program. So let me share some of the work that Lisa has done, which was kind of a different way of putting things. You know, we're talking earlier with Mignon about how do you try, how, do you, how can we prioritize childhood cancer as we speak with governments? Let's not talk about numbers. Let's not talk about incidence or prevalence. Let's talk about you know, the lives of year lost. Let's talk about DALIs, for example, right? The disability adjusted life years. And so when you put it together, and that's what Lisa did, put together the DALIs for childhood cancer in a list with all, you know, the 30 most common uh, cancers of, of, of humans, childhood cancer is number six in DALIs. If you see it's above cervical cancer, above prostate cancer, thinking about the lives lost, the years of productive life or life lost. And so if you look at the right side of the column or the, of the table, for low and low and middle income countries, childhood cancer is number one, number one in Dallas. So that's an argument that I think we can do as we engage with governments, should we prioritize childhood cancer, you know, put numbers in front of them. This is what you're going to get in the future. The second point that oftentimes comes to play is the cost. So how are we going to invest in childhood cancer? And so that's also an exercise that we did as part of the Lancet Oncology Commission a few years ago. And so we realized that by doing this micro-costing analysis, childhood cancer, no matter where you are, is quite predictable in the cost. It's about between six and seven times the GDP per capita. And so whether you are in Ghana, El Salvador, in Mexico, probably if you calculate what it would be here in the US, $200,000, dollars per patient. And so when you try to do a cost-effective analysis as you do it for, per, per DALI averted, then childhood cancer is cost-effective or even very cost-effective. And this is an important, a very strong argument as well to make. And it's not that childhood cancer is about money. We know that it is not, but when we engage at a policy level with the governments trying to convince to allocate resources, this is something that needs to be discussed. And so as part of the Lancet Oncology Commission, we also did this, um, this, uh, the, the, this costing analysis at a global scale, try to look as well at the productivity gains and the net benefits of these comprehensive scale-ups. And so you have it in the figure and in the bottom, but basically it, I need to read the numbers. So, but the, the projected cumulative treatment costs at a global scale of a comprehensive scale up. It's addressing health systems, addressing diagnosis, addressing treatment and follow-up would be about 17 billion when we did that analysis in 2020, but it would go up to about 600 billion by 2050. But the estimated global lifetime productivity gains of these children that we treat, that we cure, that become a productive part of the society would be about $2,600 billion. So the net benefit would be about, you know, uh, uh, $2,000 billion. You know, the, the, the point is that it's a more than $3 that you get back for each dollar that you invest in childhood cancer. And so this is the problem now. So we know that we can cure childhood cancer and that we can cure more than 80% of children with cancer with modern therapies and supportive care. However, as we have said, every year more than 400,000 children develop cancer. Most of these children die and most of these children live in countries with limited resources. So the reality is the global cure rates are much lower than what we say. And yet we know that there are sustainable and there are cost-effective models if we do them right. And so, although this talk is about childhood cancer, I want maybe at the end, if we have time, show a couple of slides about catastrophic blood disorders because the disparities are very similar. So at the global scale, things might have started to take a turn towards uh, a more positive outcome, 
particularly when the, the World Health Assembly in 2017 issued the, the, the cancer resolution. So it was a, a very important moment when WHO actually put uh, that, that call to action for governments. And so all the ministries of health representing the, the World Health Assembly committed to developing capacity for the diagnosis and treatment of cancer, including childhood cancer. So St. Jude has been part of that effort because we became a collaborating, a collaborating center for childhood cancer in, uh, in 2018. And as part of that effort, we, we developed through a, through a five-year agreement with WHO a plan to support the WHO to create an entire structure within the WHO to support childhood cancer. And so that's what the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer uh, was, was articulated around. And so that was announced at, uh, five years ago, this September, at the, at the, at the United Nations uh, high-level meeting on NCDs, calling for this right to cure for children with cancer. And that is the Global Initiative for Childhood Cancer, the global health you know, big piece of, 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 of technical packages that is uh, kind of led by WHO with this top-down approach engaging with governments with a cure-all technical package. Many of you are already familiar with that. So with that goal that by 2030, we'll try to get as close to 60% as possible in survival. And so the cure-all is four pillars of action and three enablers. So C stands for centers of excellence, basically build capacity at the hospital level, U, universal health coverage, R, regimens of management, so create you know, the right, you know, locally owned and grown uh, treatments, and then evaluation and monitoring with advocacy, financing, and, and policies and governance. And so that's basically a technical package that is passed on to the governments, and then the governments can enact some of these policies. So when we started that in December of 2019, there were six focus countries. Now there are about 70 countries engaged at that government level. So if at the beginning we started with about 9,000 children that could be impacted by these changes in policies and regulations and, uh, and packages, now as of uh, you know, a year ago, it's about 140,000 children that when you put together all these governments could benefit from that. And I will show here some of the early gains by engaging at this level, at a policy level with governments, that's uh, two, of the, two of the first countries, Peru and, and the Philippines, and both of them enacted laws that actually protected children with cancer financially, providing financial packages, providing them the right to access to care, but also in Peru, even providing protection to the parents that had to quit work temporarily, and so they would have salary support while their children were receiving care. Um, but, you know, this is all policy. This is about engaging governments, but there has to be work at the, at, on the ground. So this is a top-down approach, but then what can we do uh, for, for a bottom-up approach? So this is St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. As you know, that started in 1962 with this small star, and this is Danny Thomas, you know, proclaiming that no child should die in the dawn of life. And that was 1962. But from 1962, we started working already in the 1990s on these twinning partnerships, uh, developing capacity at an individual level. But we, we move a little bit more to the academic side of things in 2016, when then a Department of Global Pediatric Medicine was created to advance knowledge, generate the evidence. Then Century Global was created, which is an entity above the department, which is the institution actually moving to address global disparities, but the institution alone cannot do it. This is in partnership with, uh, with other institutions and governments, and that's what we call the St. Jude Global Alliance, which is all of us together working towards advancing care for children with cancer. But then, as we mentioned, uh, uh, the engagement with WHO led as well to engagement with other organizations that we have partnership like IAEA for radiation therapy and diagnostics or IARC for, for, for cancer registration, financial toxicity, etc., and the cure-all package that I mentioned. And so let me give you a few more details about how we do things at St. Jude. So the St. Jude Global Program 
is about this. It's about improving survival rates for children with cancer and catastrophic blood diseases through the transfer of knowledge, technology, and organizational skills with that vision that all children should have access to quality of care. And so we work with four pillars that I will review with you. Build capacity, educate, do research, and then advocate and mobilize resources. The North Star for us, as it should be, as you understand, is the patient. And so we, we focus on the patient, and, but we understand that by to, to influence the care of that child, we need to influence how hospitals manage childhood cancer. And so, but then to influence the hospital, we need to influence policies. We need to engage at the government level, at the country level. We need to engage at the regional level because there are resources that can be leveraged as well. But then we need to engage at the, at the world, at the global level, to generate that global movement that then cannot be stopped, if you wish. So to reach that child, you always need to keep in mind that you need to reach the hospital, but you cannot stay there. You need to work with the governments, whether you like it or not. You need to engage networks at a regional level, and then you need to change the world, which is something big to say. And so that's what St. Jude Global tries to do, just penetrate these four layers of complexity to, uh, to reach that child. So the St. Jude Global Alliance right now, as we said, is about 200 plus partners, hospitals, and foundations in uh, close to seven count 70 countries. We work in seven regional programs. These networks are organized uh, very organically and, and how teams come together to develop collaborative research or education or not. And then what we call the transversal programs, for lack of a better name, which is the initiatives that have to be implemented across across programs, so say nursing, so with nursing standards, nursing education, infection control, palliative care, pathology, now we're building one on child life, etc. And so that's basically how we work uh, in, uh, in, uh, from an organizational point of view. Uh, but as the WHO says, uh, you know, there is a universal truth that is no health without a workforce. So we have had to, to prioritize or build a strong academic program to train that workforce. So for that, we create the St. Jude Global Academy with two big buckets, if you wish, one that we call global professional education. That is about clinical training programs, distance learning, training seminars, and then the scholars program that I will mention, which is basically a master's in global child health that then follows the students as they graduate. So we have a big program on distance learning. Some of you are familiar with Cure for Kids, which is being revamped. It's basically having that open source of education, courses, self-paced courses, others are mentored, but then lectures, case discussions, etc. Then we have what we call the training seminars, which are these competency-based education programs that are hybrid, most of them, so teams or individuals engage in an online process for three months, four months, uh, with different blogs and different modules, and then they come to Memphis for a week, for two weeks, for a month, for it's more about behavioral change, you know, developing the project. So we have them on critical care, on infectious diseases, or neuro-oncology, leadership, nursing, etc. And so we run maybe three or four of these seminars, as we call them, every year. And then we have the clinical training programs, which are fellowships. These are properly run two to three year clinical programs, uh, you know, strategically placed around the world in partnership with universities and medical centers to provide training for the region. So in Guatemala, for Central America, we have one in Brazil and one in Uruguay for South America, one in Jordan for the, the Middle East, or in, in Mumbai for India, etc. So these are two to three year clinical training programs that are structured like that. And so, you know, we have an agreement with ACGME International, and so we, uh, the, the idea is that these programs actually have ACGME certification, and Guatemala has already gone through that certification process. And then we have the Global Scholars Program, which starts with a master's in global child health that is focused mostly on health systems innovation, health systems improvement. Then as they graduate, they become the Global Scholars, uh, which are basically a, a workforce that, that is focusing on health systems 
uh, changes and, and, and health systems innovation. And so we actually provide like internal grant funding for two years. And so most of the students actually work, some of them are pediatric oncologists, others are lawyers actually, or surgeons or nurses or, or, or foundation directors. So the idea is have this varied workforce that becomes, you know, uh, uh, that, that can tackle childhood cancer from a different angle. So it's 10 students every year, it's part time, they never have to move to Memphis, they come only in the summer and winter sessions to keep working on that. So then the other big piece is capacity building. How do we build capacity? And that's easier said than done. How do you build capacity? So because building capacity means building health systems, but also developing therapies or palliative care or nursing or how nurses administer chemotherapy at the bedside. And so capacity building is a big uh, uh, concept. And so as we started thinking about this maybe five, six years ago, we thought let's try to put a process into that. Let's try to put a method into that. Otherwise, we can get lost. And so we started thinking at the end of the day, you build capacity if you think about quality improvement methodology with these PDSA cycles, right? So think about this construct that we adapt treatments, whether a treatment or a supportive care or an intervention or a policy, for example. Then you monitor the outcomes, you assess the quality, you intervene and improve, and you keep going like that. And so as we started uh, this process and working with IDEO, you, those of you who have worked without the IDEO understand this, how might we? So we started thinking, how might we contextualize childhood cancer treatment, or how might we systematically and efficiently monitor the burden and the outcomes, create roadmaps for improvement, design and scale up interventions, strengthen the health systems, uh, to improve childhood cancer care and then influence the policies to make it all happen. And so we created uh, three research units uh, led by Nikhil, Paola, and Kath. One is the disease burden and simulation unit, one is the metrics and performance, and one is health systems. So with that disease and burden and simulation unit, we created a registry, a uh, global registry that is a cloud base that allows institutions to have good quality data to monitor incidents, monitor outcomes, monitor treatment and toxicities. They can share that data for a global registry in a de-identified manner, or they can keep the data for themselves. We are creating, or we have created the ARIA guide, which is a regime adapted management regimens that basically are done in consensus with many other organizations and practitioners all over the world and that can help the resident or the physician or the nurse in a particular hospital, whether it's in Myanmar or in Tanzania, do proper adaptation based on the local resources in a very dynamic manner, not just printing a, a paper from uh, a journal and trying to adapt that. Then we created Profile, which is a 360 evaluation tool that allows us, or institutions, to, to do a proper assessment uh, of the infrastructure, the capacity, the quality, the workforce, the policies. It's not an assessment, it's a roadmap, because then we generate some workshops around that, and then institutions develop a plan of action. So we don't call it an assessment tool in a sense, it's just kind of a, a roadmap generating tool. And then we develop the global packages, and packages are, you know, basically intervention packages that use quality improvement methodology or implementation science methodology that then you have it off the shelf almost, and say, okay, we have done it, this is how you do it, just move on with that, and we'll show you a couple of examples of that. And then systems and policies, I will mention some of these at the end, but it's about the same, it's just providing those tools to the governments, particularly to enact policies. So now you see that that construct with the tools. So the ARIA guide that helps institutions move forward with the treatment, supportive care, etc. The registry profile, the packages, and then systems and policies, and that's what we call the SJ Cares uh, framework. And then uh, research. So you know we are a research institution, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, but it's but it's more than that, obviously. We all know here that we can only advance in any disease if we really 
introduce the research method into whatever we do. It's about generating evidence, it's about acting on that. Doesn't have to be an interventional uh, trial. Uh, research can, comes in many shapes and forms. It can be uh, medical anthropology, it can be uh, about patient communication, it can be about uh, adapted therapies, it can be epidemiology. So, but the problem, as we say, is that there are no uh, evidence-based practices that really can help advance the field at a, at a global level is what we call globalization. So sometimes we think too much globally, but then you need to think about how that affects or can be defined locally. And so uh, I think you, not that you need to repeat everything, but you need to adapt, you need to contextualize everything. So I will show you three examples of collaborative research and that uses some of the tools that I mentioned and some of the contracts that we mentioned. One is the group in Mexico, the MAS, Mexican Alliance uh, with St. Jude. Uh, the Proyecto EVAT, that it's an early warning scores in Latin America, and then some of the work that we have done with China that Mignon is familiar with. So the group in Mexico wanted to address this problem. So, as you very well know, there are high treatment-related mortality around the world, and uh, and uh, in many cases, in many places, more than 30% of children die in the first month after diagnosis because the, the countries, the programs that start treatment, but they cannot manage the toxicity, particularly for children with leukemia. And one of the easiest ways to manage that is giving antibiotics immediately when the kid has fever. But here in Seattle, you monitor the time. So antibiotics have to be given in less than one hour if possible, right? But when we started work with many of these programs, it would take three hours, four hours, five hours before a patient could receive antibiotics. So that was a very simple question. So the research question was how might we improve rates of administration of antibiotics during the first hour, and the methodology, the concept that we use was quality improvement. And that's led by Paola, and that's what we call the golden hour, minutes that save lives. I'm not going to go over this slide, but that's basically a standard quality improvement methodology. So we are the strategic partners with IHI. We have learned a lot from IHI, and we have adapted a lot of the methodology. But the idea is these PDSA cycles and very rapid innovation cycles with a lot of support, with coaching, with training, using WhatsApp groups, stakeholder panels, leadership series to train the nurses, to train the doctors, uh, to train the administrators. And so over five years, you see, we started the golden hour in May of 2016, seven years. So one institution that showed that it could be done in Tijuana, Mexico. And then over the uh, subsequent years, you see from one to two to 23 to 87 institutions in Mexico now doing in this collaborative research project all at the same time with rapid cycles, a quality improvement to decrease mortality and to improve the time to administration of the first dose of antibiotic. And what you see in the middle is the people that have been trained through this process. You change the culture because you start training doctors and nurses and the quality improvement uh, methodology. More than 500 professionals are participating or have been training quality improvement, for example, in Mexico. And this is what you see, September 2021, when the major collaborative took place with 85 institutions, the, 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 the compliance with the time to administration of antibiotics was less than 40% by two years later or a year and a half later was almost uh, 80%. So there was a 68% increase in the compliance with the time to administration of antibiotics. But what's important is that there was 61% reduction in sepsis in patients with, uh, with, with cancer from 15% to 6%. And so basically we, uh, we, uh, we showed with that that actually we could implement a program at a, at a large scale, something that is microsystems as we call it, which is basically anti administration of antibiotics in a timely manner. The other is the, the Proyecto EVAT. The Proyecto EVAT is in uh, another similar project which is about uh, early warning scores. So the problem to address is that, as we know, hospitalized children with cancer at high risk of clinical deterioration and death. And so the research question is, Yes, here one of our common practices is to use PUS, Pediatric Early Warning Scores. 
And so can we resource adapt them for institutions that have less nurses, less time to that, for early detection of deterioration and to uh, apply appropriate interventions? And should this, if we can do it, impact mortality for that? We use more like an implementation science approach. We are all very familiar with the PUSE. I'm not going to review that, the, the PUSE algorithms. But we just move it into an adaptation process for Guatemala as a proof of concept, and that's all led by, by Asia Gulnik. And so the PUSE was translated to Spanish, was implemented, was tested, alpha and beta testing, because it had to be modified based on the resources. But then it was validated in these pediatric oncology patients. And then when it was implemented, it resort, resulted in fewer deterioration events, reduced uh, PQ utilization, improved communication and staff uh, empowerment, and with a costing analysis, and also showed cost savings of more than $350,000 per year for a, uni a unit in Guatemala that is significantly resource limited. So you do an intervention that actually can save money as well, and so this money can be rerouted to other things. Now, if you go to Latin America, you will see that in any pediatric oncology ward in almost more than 80 institutions, they may not have resources, as you can see by the, the, by, by the pictures, but they will all use the green, yellow, red buttons or, or markers, so all the children actually have, uh, have the, 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 the pews monitored. So that's the Proyecto EVAD, as we call it now, it's 80 plus institutions across the entire region, and so that has also shown significant impact. So 84 centers for 20, from 20 countries, more than 11,000 clinicians trained, more than 41,000 admissions impacted, the clinical deterioration of end mortality decreased by 25% during this time, and also like we did for the golden hour, it also changed hospital practices beyond childhood cancer wars in many of these hospitals, by doing that for childhood cancer, now the hospitals had adapted PUs uh, as a hospital practice, and that's, we are interested, it was published in Lancet Oncology a couple of weeks ago by Asia and, and her team. So the point is about, you know, bringing the methodology into this microsystem level, QI, so quality improvement implementation science, as anchors to collaborative research. Then as institutions start understanding the importance of data, the importance of sharing data, the importance of quality of data, I think that there is an appetite to then advance in the clinical research journey, and so that then <coughs> clinical research studies are, 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 are ready. And then the last example, and Mignon is more uh, familiar with that, is a large scale uh, clinical trial development, and that is something Dr. Pui developed and in, in China, uh, kind of putting together a large cohort of institutions, more than 26 medical centers, that basically is 70% of the population. And I will not go into the details of all these trials, but just meaning that, you know, global health also is that. It's just, you know, working in partnership with large programs, with institutions that are ready for that. And so teaching them how to conduct a clinical trial partner, with them for quality controls, et cetera, et cetera. And so launching these large trials that are larger than many other institutions could or organizations could do and actually can contribute as well to childhood cancer by helping change some of the practices. So this is kind of that transition. So we need to develop evidence. It's about developing or choosing the right methodology, whether it's quality improvement, implementation science, or clinical trials but then also population science, epi, or etiological research. And so this is what I was referring to. And so we started talking about this macro level when we talk about policy, et cetera. But there is something that Paola uh, always brings up, which is a very nice uh, construct, if you wish. We work as physicians at the microsystems level, and we love it. This is what we know. We know this methodology. And you know, at the microsystem level, there are two, three, four levels of work. But then as we start engaging at a multi-institutional level with multiple programs, you start influencing what we call this meso level. You start changing the culture at an at, at, at a, at a institutional level in multiple institutions, and that eventually can influence what we call the macro level. So the two examples that I show you, the golden hour and the EVAD, 
actually have made it into policy. The Pan American Health Organization has put these two things as part of their technical packages as they engage with governments to improve care for children with cancer. So I, I like that idea that we as a physicians, we work at the microsystem level, we feel a little less comfortable at the macro system, but we all need to feel comfortable that if we do it well at the micro, it goes into the meso and then into the macro level. And so that's the model I was trying to read to say, you know, we need to reach the patient, but then at this microsystem level, we can influence hospitals, countries, regions, and we can influence policies at a global scale. Let me take you back for two minutes to what we were talking about WHO. We are a collaborating center for WHO, so we are technical, uh, we provide the technical support for national cancer control plans, for education, but also for, 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 for the stakeholder engagement. And so some of the tools that I mentioned earlier are about this. So, for example, CAT has put together a set of tools. One is this policy monitor that has is this database with thousands, not thousands, <laughs> it's probably 1,500 documents, policy documents that are searchable, that can be uh, 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 analyzed by region, by language, by type. And so with that, then we provide what we call the NCCP digest. So we provide the governments with a policy brief, if you wish, with a landscape, with what we call an NCCP policy snapshot about what they need to do, and then a dialogue facilitator. So we provide that package through our unit as we engage with governments and stakeholders within the government that oftentimes don't know how to start this process for pediatrics. And then we started this past year, CAD started this uh, NCCP ICAIA, which is this National Cancer Control Planning to, for, for children, adolescents, and, and young adults. And this is because many institutions, many governments lack National Cancer Control Plans. They don't know how to prioritize children with cancer. So we developed this learning series, which is about a six month, four to six month series, where uh, they do multiple you know, policy driven training workshops, case studies, uh, you know, exercises that I need to do. And so the, the, the 17 countries just graduated, I believe, three weeks ago. 17 countries, more than 30 cities, more than 100 participants, policy makers, national level, etc. It's little by little changing the understanding of how to prioritize childhood cancer and what to do for that. And so that's the cure-all package. And then we help programs go through the core projects. I, we don't need to go into detail, but basically we weld them with our tools and in partnership with many other uh, organizations in going step by step by step by step on all these pieces that need to be addressed. Then we have also put together what we call a, you know, a, a dashboard, a cure-all dashboard, that it's, it's important to, to, to be accountable, to be able to be monitored, to monitor yourself, and to be evaluated. And so that also stimulates this dialogue across institutions as they can review dashboards and, and work together towards that. And so that kind of micro to macro system is basically what that, that comprehensive approach means. I take you back to one of the work that we did with the Lancet Oncology about the projected effects of different scale-up scenarios. And I'm going to just be very brief about this. So basically, if you, only, if you only affect health systems, just basically to do referral, just, okay, that's what I'm going to do, change policy, make sure kids are diagnosed, they can be referred, you would be averting about one million lives. If you improve social support to avoid abandonment, you may save 250,000 lives globally. If you improve treatment, you may save two million. But if you put it all together as a package, you can save up to six million lives. And that's the idea of never forgetting this macro, micro, macro, meso. So always pay attention about what the other level needs to do. And I, I will finish with this. So I show this picture. What is common for each one of these children is that they are either receiving treatment or waiting to receive treatment. And in many cases, like the picture on the right, that child probably did not have any drugs to receive and probably was waiting to get them. And so that is a major issue. It's here in Seattle, in Memphis, in any place, drug shortages. Now we have a shortage in cisplatin, on carboplatin. If we have a shortage here in the US, you imagine how the shortage is globally. There is no carboplatin, there is no cisplatin. 
So there are many problems in availability, in the quality, and in the costs. And so the idea is, can we put it all together, develop this global platform, like a central procurement and monitoring entity that could just provide access to those drugs? And so the potential impact of that would be an integrated global framework for forecasting and the stabilization of the value chain to decrease the stockouts, lower the cost, ensure safety, guarantee access to safe, effective, and quality drugs, and also provide additional mechanisms that you could use for, for implementation. And so we have created this platform together with the World Health Organization, a global platform for access to medicine similar to the Global Fund with an operational unit in the WHO. Right now, St. Jude is the main donor, but hopefully in the future, uh, governments and foundations will provide with a procurement agency that will be UNICEF and PAHO for the Americas that will be responsible for engaging with the manufacturers and doing all the distribution to the foundations, the governments, and the hospitals, and then with a governance structure that oversees that from outside, a steering committee and technical advisory boards where uh, organizations like SAI or Childhood Cancer International representing parents and survivors would be part. So we have committed $200 million for that over the next five years in partnership with these organizations. And we have it in three phases. Now we are finishing the development phase, that is governance and operations. So we'll start in January with the, with the pilot phase, that it's basically six, uh, six countries, one from each WHO region, uh, and then up to 12 countries the first two years, and then growing up to 50 countries. So hopefully up to 50,000 children per year could receive medications at no cost. And so by, by 2027, if we get 50,000 children, there will be about 220,000 children during this period that will have received this. But 50,000 children is 25% of all children with cancer in the world, but actually 60 to 70% of all children with cancer in low and lower middle income countries. And this is where we are. I'm not going to get into much detail. It uh, took a lot, you know, Two months ago, we had six countries, UNICEF, WHO in Memphis, doing a, a workshop on design of what we call the last mile. So what happens? Yes, we can bring the drugs, but then what happens the moment the drugs get into the, into the country? And that's the most important piece. And so that's what we are finalizing right now. And then I will end with this. So I did, we show that map of childhood cancer. Well, this is the map of newborns with sickle cell disease. So every year about 300,000 children are born with sickle cell disease. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, 90% of these infants die by age five, just because of lack of basic diagnosis and treatment. So there are no survivors of sickle cell disease in Africa. And so think about this. So if we just diagnose at birth basic newborn screening, Kids receive prophylaxis penicillin, uh, pneumococcal vaccine, and hydroxyurea. Immediately, you would push that survival from zero or 50 percent to about 95 percent. If you can start a screening with a TCD for the strokes, you would be able to prevent more than 90 percent of the strokes. When children with hemophilia would receive prophylactic treatment, you would similarly see this major impact. And so uh, what I told you about childhood cancer, we're trying to replicate the same for catastrophic blood diseases. And so I'm not going to do, go into much detail because I would require another hour about how to develop that in a comprehensive manner. And so, and with that I will end. So I, we started with this epidemiologic transition that with improvements in maternal and child health, and as countries, progress through the MDG and the, the, the SDG goals, the, we see an increase in the burden of childhood cancer and catastrophic blood diseases. And so we're talking with, uh, you know, Mignon early is about catastrophic diseases of childhood, not so much about childhood cancer. And this epidemic, epidemiological transition is affecting that. And so in the advances with the global health agenda have created this unique opportunity to accelerate progress in cancer and catastrophic blood diseases and for children globally. And so this creates this imperative to develop accurate, sustainable, and scalable plans. And so the challenge of our generation, those of us here, 
will be to decrease these global disparities and share the progress that we have made in advancing the cures for children with cancer and catastrophic blood diseases to children all over the world so that what we do is for every child and everywhere. And with that, I would like to just thank everyone at St. Jude, uh, St. Jude Global. These are the directors and the faculty. All of them are responsible for what you saw, and all of them lead teams that I could not put all the pictures here, but basically this is the group that is, that is running uh, all the programs that I share with you. With that, I will stop here. I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for that. And I will open things up to questions. Don't be shy. If you have a question in the room, let me know. I had two questions and you answered one. The first was access to medicines because they're not even available here, but that, that's a huge issue. I think having the medicines be available and then getting them to the, to the patient. The second, I guess, is what I'll ask is on your foreign, I don't know what to call them, I guess fellowship programs, what is the is it the limit of physicians, primary care physicians, or you know resident or fellow fellow oncologists, or is it a problem with teaching them and getting the the information to those uh, prospective doctors? Yeah, so I think it's it's uh, probably multifactorial. One is candidates because childhood cancer is not a very appealing career. Second is for the, these candidates to have a place to go because many institutions don't provide this, this type of career paths or in pediatric oncology. So we try to secure that by just making sure that, you know, as we train these, these candidates, there is a commitment by the institutions to develop uh, a program. But then the teaching, and then the third one is the teaching. So how to make sure that this is done in a way. So we are very careful in the selection of the programs that can do it. Uh, we, you know, the world has great professionals everywhere. It's just that the resources maybe cannot match their capacity or their quality. So it's not so difficult to build it like that. But then, of course, from St. Jude, we help a lot with the curriculum. And so we follow the ACGME and the American Board of Pediatrics curriculum. And we teach a lot as well. And then some of the, the fellows as well rotate outside of. But then we have ACGME. And so then ACGME is basically providing that you know, auditing and monitoring for training, for fellow progression, et cetera. And so the idea is that, not that they have to be a GME accredited, it's just this that seal of quality. And so they, there is some accountability once a program becomes a GME accredited. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yes. Hi, um, thanks so much for a really wonderful, inspiring talk from you know, yourself, your team, and all your global partners. Um, <clears throat> my question is about some of the data I saw uh, you, you presented right at the beginning of the talk. I was really struck by that big difference between children who you know, develop cancer and who end up actually being diagnosed with cancer. So my question was, you know, what kind of things, if anything, have, have you and your partners been working on to, to bridge that gap. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges, right? Because um, it's, um, oftentimes it just reflects a very, you know, immature health system that you cannot correct. And so, um, and also you don't want to diagnose patients. You, no, you don't want to. You want to diagnose patients, but then you need to be very realistic that this increases the burden into the existing services. And so, uh, we have uh, done some small projects here and there, but we work a lot with WHO and UNICEF in that particular case to train the primary workforce and so to create the referral pathways that then can just take these children to where they, they can be treated. But that's very, it's a very pervasive problem because then you hit cultural barriers and social barriers, religious barriers. So um, we have a program led by Dylan Gratz at St. Jude that is what we call culturally sensitive patient care, which is basically our medical anthropology unit. So we're trying to understand better that through a lot of exercises that we do with communities 
to understand the concept of childhood cancer, the concept of death, you know, and what it takes for these families to accept that. So, I don't know, it's just a very complex problem. <laughs> I think, that, yeah, we can influence policies, we can influence primary care, but there is a lot in between that needs to be addressed, yeah. And then, diagnosis, you know, we not talk about diagnostics, which is another big thing. We have a big platform that we're, maybe another day we can talk, which is about how to improve diagnostics as well. I have a question from online, Dr. Goost. Um, two things, incredible work with so many important issues. How do you figure out what to prioritize and how do you obtain sustainable funding for all of the projects? Yeah, well, the priority exercise is a complex one. And so at a country level, we do this exercise so that, because the last thing you want is just to, to put pressure on programs that they cannot sustain. So a lot of the tools that I show, the C5 or the profile, are prioritization exercises. So we do this mapping, we do collaborative discussions, and then we do an exercise about prioritization. And it's about, you know, you know the, 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 the impact versus the resources that you need to use, et cetera. So, but prioritization starts at the local level. What can be done at a local level? Then for us, I think the prioritization exercise kind of follows that then. We see that that's where the needs are in education. So we try to prioritize education for that particular region or other. In terms of the model, so the, uh, the financial, the finances. So yeah, that's a big question, right? So we are well resourced and I can say that we are fortunate about that. Of course, a lot of the research that we do is also grant funded and Lisa knows about that. <laughs> and so, but, um, but that's a minority of what we do. A lot of the work that we do, the funding is just soft money that has to go into the programs. But at the, at the county level, at the county level, our investments are relatively limited to the point that, yes, we do immediately transition plans so that the governments, local organizations have to take over. We don't pay for patient care, uh, almost never. So sometimes we do it, but we are very sensitive about that, otherwise it's not sustainable. And so, um, but uh, one of the problems that we have is about resource mobilization. So working, you cannot expect that governments would assume everything. So as we work with governments, we create that force, the civil society, you know, the the foundations, the parents' organizations, there's a lot of, even in a low-income country, you can mobilize resources, and it's quite impressive what you can mobilize, yeah. yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but I want to thank you so much and all of your team for all the work you've done, and thank you for being here for Grand Rounds. We'll see you all next week. Thanks.